All right. It's good to see everybody today. My name is John Williamson. I'm an engineer by trade. I work in the oil and gas business. Did st neat stuff with gas gathering platforms and flare systems and that sort of thing. I'm taking a break from that right now to go to a seminary. That's, I'm about a year, year and a half away from graduating from Dallas Theological Seminary, struggling through Greek and Hebrew, having a good time with it. These days I'm doing other things, like I'm a chaplain at the Harris County Jail downtown. I am a counselor and sometimes speaker for Camp Arete. It's a Christian summer, summer camp for the youth. I also teach the teenagers here at West Houston Bible Church. So, but today we're going to be having a fun presentation. It's a, it's a little bit difficult in that we're going to be thinking about thinking. We normally, we think a lot, but we don't think about how we think. So that's what the presentation is going to be on. And I'm a bit concerned that I might just go way too fast and stomp on everybody and get through and proclaim victory and no one has any clue what happened. So what I'm wanting y'all to do is interact with me. If y'all got a question, don't understand something, want clarification, you've got something that you, you just want to ask about, raise your hand. Now, we've got microphones up here, but they'll pick up your question better if you're closer in. But, so you can stay where you want or you can move up closer either way. But I want to have this to be interactive. You tracking with me? Good, good. So just raise your hand. I'll point at you, and I want you to talk. And if you, and you ask a question, try to speak loudly enough so that everyone can hear you and the microphones can pick you up. That sound good? Okay. In that case, I reckon it's about time we get started. We're going to be talking about the Word of God, so we always need to make sure that God's with us, that the Holy Spirit's with us. Otherwise, we're not going to be doing anything productive. What do you figure? Yeah. So this church, one of the things we always uh, like to emphasize is uh, confession is sent before our prayer. See, uh, we believe in the biblical God, the triune God. He's the creator God. He made it, the world and he made it good. He made man in his image, but man fell and, fe and fell into sin. But he prom had a great promise in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would destroy that snake, get rid of the curse, and bring us eternal life. Now, this God, this triune God who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at the same time, think it might be good to talk to him Think it might be good to talk to him? Yeah. Yes, good, good. And so he's, he's a good person to talk to. Now, sometimes this God won't listen to us. One of the reasons this God won't listen to us is if we've got unconfessed sin in our lives. We've got unconfessed sin in our lives. This God, he doesn't listen to us. So we've got a nice scripture in 1 John, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So before we like to pray, we always give y'all all a, a few moments of silent prayer to confess whatever sins are in your life so God will heed your prayer. And I reckon that's pretty important. What do y'all think? Yeah, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll give y'all a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll get going. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and worship you through the study of your word, through the study of who you are, and through a fellowship with one with another. We've got a few things to ask you for, and I ask you to listen to our prayers. We got. I pray for all those folks that are suffering with the hurricanes and the earthquakes and the fires that are going on around here. Uh, I know that you're in charge. That in the Bible it says that you're the one who wounds, you're the one who heals, you're the one who puts to death, and you're the one who gives life. So I pray that you give healing and life to those who are in trouble. And while you're doing that, you send ministers of the gospel to places that otherwise would be closed, so that many people can hear and believe and have life. I pray that your spirit will be with us today, that you'll help me to speak well and speak truth and help the, everyone listening in the audience or online to be able to understand and that we'll all have a better appreciation for your glory when we leave this building than we walked in. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have life and hope, amen. All right, so the topic we got today before us is the ultimate proof of the Bible. Now, an ultimate proof, when I say ultimate proof, that's a pretty bold statement. I mean, I, that means there's nothing better than this, and I believe so. Now, we've got to talk about what I mean by ultimate proof first. If by ultimate, I mean it will ha there will be, uh, everyone will be convinced or persuaded, then no, it's not ultimate. Because unfortunately, people are often not persuaded by a very good argument, and sometimes they are persuaded by a very bad argument. Most of these arguments are called logical fallacies because they persuade, but they're not, but they're flawed in some manner. So, uh, I'm not, so this thing will not persuade everybody. But by, ult by ultimate, you mean absolutely irrefutable and conclusive, then yes, this is that. 
Now, this is a bit of a you know, difficult topic, because as I said, I hope you all brought your thinking caps, because so we're going to be thinking about thinking. And I think that's kind of cool. But you, it, we're not used to ta- thinking about the basic fundamentals of life, and, uh, of knowledge, and, how, and what we know, or, or, or our epistemology. So I'm going to try to go kind of slow, and we're going to work through this logically. So I've got five things I want to talk about. First, the nature and role of evidence in the uh, debate about worldviews. Second, I want to talk about the nature of knowledge. What is knowledge? How do we know things? And that will, ult- that will lead, logically, to a discussion about ultimate standards. What are they? How can we judge them? And what do they mean? When that, which will follow into preconditions of intelligibility. That's a big word, or several big words, actually. But we'll talk about it, and, and by the time I'm done with that, hopefully y'all will understand what I'm talking about there. And finally, I'm going to lead, you know, give y'all the ultimate proof of the Bible. This is one of those things that I don't talk about much because it's kind of le- takes a bit of time to lead up to it and uh, explain it so people so it makes sense to people. But by the time we're done with our hour here, I think we'll have uh, have done that. All right, so everyone tracking with me so far? Yes. Good, good. So first, we're going to talk about the nature of evidence. Uh, there's all, an idea in the world that uh, the I, debate between, say, Christians and, uh, and evolutionists can be de- decided by, based on evidence. If you have enough evidence, you just put the, the, the evidence on the scale, and whoever has the more evident, most evidence wins. And I'm going to talk to you about how ev- evidence can be used and what it's uh, good for and what it's not. Now, I'm an, ev- I'm a, an engineer. I'm a scientist. I love scientific evidence. If I was going to give you a topic about scientific evidence that, dem- that confirms the Bible, I could talk for about eight hours straight. I would love to do that. Today, I'm going to give you one. And we're going to discuss how the, this works and how the evolutionists uh, deal with that issue. Oh, also, today I'm going to be talking primarily about the biblical worldview as opposed to the evolutionary worldview. There are other worldviews proposed by other gods or other religions. If you have questions, we can deal with that. But my presentation is going to be focused primarily on the evolutionary idea. Tracking with me? Good. So let's talk about comets for a second. I like comets. Has any, have any of you ever seen a comet in the sky? Yeah, I have. it. They're real, they're real pretty, aren't they? So comets are basically sm- relatively small balls of ice out in the solar system. They normally have a diameter of about a, you know, of a two or three miles at most. And they orbit in highly elliptical patterns around the sun. An ellipse, elliptical pattern, basically means it's a circle that's been stretched out a lot. Right? They spend most of their time far away from the sun, moving slowly, but eventually they fall into the inner solar system and move real fast, and, that, and they develop their tails. You can see on this picture they've got two tails. One is an ion tail. That's all, they, uh, that always points directly away from the sun. And there's a dust tail that points generally away from the sun, but it's skewed a little bit by their motion. So it, it surprises people often that the tails don't point away from their direction of motion. But what's going on here is the sun is blasting away with the, with the solar wind. They're blasting away at the comet. So the comet is uh, hemorrhaging material in its two tails. You tracking with me? Understand? So every time the comet passes around the sun, Is it getting bigger or is it getting smaller? Smaller. Why do you say smaller? Yeah, stuff is coming off of it. So every every time this comet goes along the sun, it gets smaller. So uh, eventually, uh, it would get so small that it would disintegrate or fall apart. Now, a few years ago, there was a a comet that was supposed to come around that would be very spectacular. It was called ISON, I-S-O-N. It, 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 did it, do any of you remember that? I remember seeing advertisements for ISON, fires in the sky. No? Well, that was a few years ago. And th- this is the first time we'd ever seen this comet come around. And it, came, and it went, went near the sun and it broke apart. One pass, it, it disintegrated, destroyed. So comets are constantly losing the mass. They're kind of like the ice cream cones of the galaxy. If you walk into a sauna and you see an ice cream cone sitting there, you, fi- you can figure that it probably was, uh, wasn't put there very long ago, right? Otherwise, it would have melted. Similarly with comets. They're constantly getting smaller. So we can calculate how long it would take for a comet to disintegrate to nothing. And the biggest comets we know of would only last about 100,000 years, at the longest. Now, many of them are much shorter than that. However, now, the evolutionary worldview suggests that the Earth, that the solar system, is four and a half billion, that's with a B, years old. 
Now, how does a 100,000-year-old comet fit with a 4.5-billion-year-old solar system? Well or badly? Badly. Yes. Now, that fits very well with a biblical time frame. The Bible teaches about thousands of years. So 100,000 years fits into the thousands of years biblical time frame, but it completely is out of whack with an evolutionary billions of years time frame. So evolution stands refuted. Secularism is dead. Everyone's going to become a Christian and, and, follow, and learn the Bible and follow Christ, right? No? No, I don't think they will. The reason is because the, uh, e the evolutionist will appeal to his worldview. He says, uh, and to come up with an answer. He says, we know that the, that the solar system is four and a half billion years old, so we need to figure out how comets are seen in an old unit solar system. So what they do is they appeal to their worldview. A worldview is a network of our most basic beliefs about reality, in light of which all observations are interpreted. Now, all of us have a worldview. Some people have a worldview that says they have no worldview, but that is itself a worldview. It is utterly inescapable to have a worldview. Now, I propose a biblical Christian worldview in which all of our knowledge, all of our basics about who man is, what the universe is, what is our purpose, what, and many other things are, are found. And the evolutionists proclaim, pro, uh, have a naturalistic worldview of sorts. There's other worldviews out there, but they all are, you know, there's some similarities to them. So if you want, the evolutionist wants to save their, their evolutionary worldview from the thousands of years' comets, what they do is they invoke a rescuing device. They appeal to their worldview to justify a rescuing device, which is a conjecture designed to save a person's worldview from apparently contrary evidence. Does anybody know how evolutionists say uh, what the rescuing device is for comets? Anyone know? Yes, the Oort cloud. Exactly that. The Oort cloud is named after a Dutch astronomer, Jan Oort. That's O-O-R-T. And he proposes that there's a vast sphere of, of small icy bodies at very, very great distances from the sun. And it's so far away and the, and the objects are so small that they are un utterly unobservable. That we cannot detect them. But and eventually, uh, some passing star or other object will perturb one of these icy bodies and make it fall into the solar system for it to, to make a new comet. Now, do we have any observational evidence for an Oort cloud? Absolutely none. But can I prove there's not an Oort cloud? No, I can't see it. I can't. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So I can't prove there's not an Oort cloud, but I have no reason to believe in an Oort cloud. The evolutionist believes in, in an Oort cloud because his worldview demands that there's some sort of solution to this problem. And no matter what problem you bring up, whether it's information in DNA, whether it's Earth's decaying magnetic field, whether it's evidence of design everywhere in creation, the evolutionist can always appeal to the unknown to save his worldview. You tracking with me? Have I, have I lost anybody yet? No, I haven't lost anybody? Okay. So to resolve this debate, we must then uh, examine worldviews. We gotta see which one is uh, works, and we so we're, we're if you think about like an iceberg. Most people fight at the very top of the iceberg, but every but all but all the mass of the thing is below below decks. That's a worldview. A worldview is something you don't normally see, but it influences everything you do and think and say. So uh, let's talk about the biblical worldview here. I'm going to talk about what the biblical worldview is basically, and I got a few points, but there's a lot more could be added to it. But I want to be kind of brief, and then I'll talk about the evolutionary worldview. So the base. Put, put simply, the biblical worldview states the Bible is the foundation for all knowledge. Now, it doesn't mean that all knowledge is contained in the Bible, but we start there, and from the foundation of the Bible, we reason to everything else. So you want to talk about how we separate sulfur from, uh, uh, from hydrocarbons in the oil and gas industry. If you want to do it rationally, you start from the Bible, and you eventually reason there. I can, I can demonstrate that for you, but it probably puts you all to sleep, so I'll, I'll save you. So the biblical worldview states that we have a triune God, who created the universe thousands of years ago in six literal days. That the world was destroyed in the flood of Noah's day. That the languages that were confu confused at the Tower of Babel explains our different languages we got today. That Jesus died on the cross to redeem fallen man and that Jesus will, in the future, return to raise the dead and judge the world. So there's other things you could add here, but 
is basically this, you know, what the Bible teaches, plainly. So, the, so to contrast with that is the evolutionary worldview. Now, the evolutionary worldview is nowhere near as coherent as the biblical worldview because there's a lot of different adherents. So, now, almost everyone who's an evolutionist believes in naturalism of some sort. Now, so occasionally you'll have some theistic evolutionists, but that doesn't save the day. They have the same problems. We'll, we, we'll talk about that if you want. But most of them believe in naturalism. This is the belief that natural or material objects, as opposed to supernatural or immaterial forces, only exist in the universe. So that there's no such thing as spirits or angels or the soul in the, in the, in the naturalistic universe. All it is is matter and motion, physics and chemistry. Tracking with me? Okay, I think so. No one's dying out there, right? Good. Now, they have different ways of, of epistemology. And epistemology is how do you know what you know? It's a philosophy of knowledge. Some of them are rationalists. Rationalists believe that all knowledge is gained through human reason and deduction, that, that knowledge starts up here, that you start in your head and you reason out. Others, these are probably the most common, I think, that I've encountered, are empiricists. They believe in empiricism, which is the idea that all knowledge is gained by empirical or sensory observation. Basically, I see it, smell it, touch it, feel it, hear it, and through, through gathering these sensory observations, I can understand the world. Now, there's nothing wrong with using uh, empirical observation to some extent, but empiricism is the belief that all knowledge is gained through this uh, system. Can anyone think of any problems with this, with the empiricism idea? Got anything? Well, the astute thinker will eventually ask the empiricist, how do you prove this statement itself? How do you prove that all knowledge is gained by empirical observation? If the empiricist says that, well, I've observed it to be true, therefore it is true, what have they done? Someone? They've, they've engaged in circular reasoning, empirical, which is uh, begging the question, which is a logical fallacy, because you're assuming the, the very thing that you are trying to prove. If they say that, I've, that you prove it in some other way, then they have refuted the very statement itself that all knowledge is gained through empirical observation. But anyway, moving on. And often, there's a, there's a number of them that once they, they've tried rationalism, they've tried empiricism, they despair of knowledge in, uh, as a whole, and they b fall into relativism. This is the belief that there are no universal absolutes and all truth in knowledge is relative. If you've ever heard anyone say, that's true for me, but not true for you, or something like that, that's, that's, that person is a relativist. Now, whenever I, whenever I hear someone say there's no, no absolutes, what, you know what I like to say? Yeah, I, I like to ask them, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> and uh, they don't know how to answer that. So, but we, we track them basically on what the biblical and the evolutionary worldviews are, and that they're different ideas of knowledge, right? So let's talk about the nature of knowledge. If we're going to know things, we need to think about how this goes. D knowledge is classically defined as justified, true belief. You've got to have all three things. It's, to, to have something justified means that we have reason to believe it, right? If it's true, it means it corresponds to reality, and belief means we accept or acknowledge that it's truth, that we, we think it's true. So you have to have all three of these things to have knowledge. Let's give some examples. Let's say that there's a, a woman, who here has been to a church picnic? Yeah, now picture you're going to have a church picnic and there's a lady in the church that you're talking to and says, I just know the church picnic three months from now is going to have beautiful weather. And then three months later, uh, the time comes, and you know what? There's, the, there's beautiful weather for the picnic. Did that woman actually know the weather was going to be beautiful? No. She, cause she, now her, her belief, she believed it. it. Her belief happened to be true, but she had no reason to believe it. Her belief was arbitrary. Arbitrary means to be without a reason. So she didn't really know it. Another example for uh, Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus was a pharaoh of Egypt, you know, back a long time ago. And he was real involved in the Ptolemaic model of the solar system, which was geocentric. He believed that the earth was the center of the solar system and everything revolved around that. He justified it because he looked, at, looked around, he saw the sun rise up and set, he saw the moon rise up and set, he saw the stars move across the sky. And he believed it, but it wasn't true, was it? So he didn't really have knowledge because he was believing something that was false. 
And, uh, and if you don't, be- and if there's something you don't believe, then you don't really know it. It's not knowledge for you. There's like a Kyrie Irving, a player for the, he used to be for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now he was traded to the Boston Celtics. He made waves recently when he said that he believed the earth was flat. Now, we have very good reason to believe the earth is a sphere- spherical. And it is true that the earth is spherical, but he doesn't believe it. So he does not have, possess this knowledge. This makes sense to everybody. You track him with, with what this means and why we got to have it. Now, I've got this, this chain here, this paper chain. Because once we, uh, so this is the chain of justification is what I like to think of it. When we, if we know something, we got, you ask, well, why? How do you know that? You ever have one of those kids that you tell them something and say, why? And then you tell them something else and say, why? Why? And you just keep going down and eventually you're like, well, that's just the way it is or something. You ever encounter that? Yeah, well, this is basically what we're doing. Every statement you make, you've got to justify. And then you ask, well, how do you justify that other statement? For example, let's say I, have, I believe in Proposition A. Whatever, that can be what, any, any statement there is. You ask, well, why do you believe in A? I'll say I believe it because of the truth of B. Well, why do you believe in B? Because of the truth of C. And so on and so forth. But eventually... We've got this, this chain of reasoning has to end because we are finite beings. Is anyone here infinite? Anyone at all? No, we're all finite, which means that we are limited. We cannot reason forever. So all chains of reasoning have to come to an end. Otherwise, we don't know anything. You, you tracking with me here? All right. So eventually what that leads us to is an ultimate standard. An ultimate standard is where the chain of reasoning ends. And now the astute person or that little child will ask, well, why or how do you justify an ultimate standard? There's three answers to this. Two of them are bad and one of them is good. And I'd like, so the first bad answer is you can say, well, let's say I have ultimate standards. Let's call it Q. Okay. Well, a bad answer would be say, well, I justify my ultimate standard Q by standard R. Why is that a bad standard? Why is that a bad answer? That's right, because then it's not your ultimate standard. And then you've got to justify R in the same way. Another bad, bad answer is it's justified by some, it, it doesn't need to be justified at all. Which means that if you don't justify it, you don't have a reason to believe in your ultimate standard, then what, do you, then what, what does that mean? Anyone? means you don't know it. If, you're, if knowledge is justified true belief and you don't have a reason to believe in your ultimate standard, then you don't know it. And what happens to everything is built on your reasoning that leads to that. It means you don't know those things either, so it all collapses. So if your ultimate standard is unjustified, it leads to the embarrassing fact that you cannot know anything at all. Yes. Now, so the, the good answer here, possibly, it could be bad. The good answer here is if you could, the standard justifies itself in a non-arbitrary fashion. Now, there's, there should, there's an object, objection that should raise in people's minds here. What was the objection? Have a standard justify itself. Standard Q is justified by Q. It's circular. I heard someone say it. Yes, but circular reasoning is one of those interesting fallacies that the, the reasoning is valid because you're, it's basically a restatement of your premise. The, the conclusion is a restatement of the premise. But, but it's normally considered fallacious because it's arbitrary, because it does not, uh, because it's, there's no outside evidence to support it. So we're going to talk about ultimate standards and how you justify them. Because if we're going to have knowledge, we've got to ha- have a reason to believe in our ultimate standard, right? We believe, we're tracking with me? This is a logical necessity. You can't escape it. Everyone's got to deal with this, if you think about it. So here's the question. How does a worldview justify itself in a non-arbitrary fashion. We got any, got, got any ideas? We all stumped. Answer. A good, rational worldview must have two things. One, it must be logically consistent. If your worldview contains contradictions, can that worldview be true? Can that standard be, be, be the ultimate standard? Anyone? No. If it had, it, because if something, it can't, something cannot be both true and false in the same sense at the same time simultaneously. If it is both of these things, then it is false and cannot, or is a bad ultimate standard. The second is it's got to provide for the preconditions of intelligibility. 
which leads, which leads to the natural question, what the heck are preconditions of intelligibility, right? So we'll, an ultimate standard's got to provide for, and we'll talk about how this is done. So here's some, some of the preconditions of intelligible, intelligibility. These are things that must be true before you can even begin to reason or think about things, okay? So here's, I'm going to talk, talk, tell you five here. There's a lot more we can talk about, but I'm going to limit it to five, and I'm going to talk about three of them in more greater detail. First one is the general, general reliability of our memory. You've got to assume this is true before you can even begin to investigate the world. Now, somebody might say, well, I know I've got a good memory because I took a memory test last week and I got a perfect score. But the, you could respond uh, with, how do you know you did? Do you... Is your memory, you're assuming your memory is valid. It becomes actually rather challenging to, assume, to, to prove that your memory is valid and that you're not just remembering false things. Another one is the general reliability of our senses. Now, I'm not saying they have to be infallible, but that generally reliable. That what I see, that I see I'm in a church room with people in the, in the audience with blue chairs and I can hear things and make, have smells and feel things, right? That my senses are generally reliable. If I don't believe my senses are generally reliable, then how can I interact with the world? What, are, what, what value are my observations? Are they of any value whatsoever? The answer is no. Now, we can pr demonstrate these through the Bible. I'm going to focus more on these next three. One of them is the laws of logic. The laws of logic are the proper method of thinking there, uh, between concepts, abstract, abstract, abstract concepts. So uh, that, that's how we go from uh, you know, reason about things. If we don't have laws of logic, then there's no reason or thinking about anything at all. Laws of morality. These are, this is what should we do, what ought we to do. And we ought to reason well, so we ought to use the laws of logic. And, uh, the, and finally, I'm going to say the uniformity of nature, also known as the principle of induction. So we'll talk about these and, at, and figure out how they're justified. All right. Have I lost anybody yet? Nope. No one's dying. That's good. So we're going to talk about the laws of logic. They are universal. That, that means they apply everywhere. They're abstract. That means they are laws of thought and are not material. So you can't trip over a law of logic. And they are invariant. They do not change with time. So now, in the, now, now let's think for a second. I want to answer from somebody out there. In a biblical Christian worldview, how would you justify an abstract invariant law entity, such as a law of logic? Is it hard? Or can you think, anybody think of anything that in, the, in, the, in the Bible that sounds like that might be a support for an abstract, universal, timeless entity? God. God. Yes. Answer, you appeal to a universal, that's a universal, abstract, invariant creator God. That's the God of the Bible. You've heard that God is omnipresent? What does that mean? He's everywhere. There's nowhere you can go to get away from him. You could also say that means he's universal. Abstract? Is God, is God material? No, you're not going to go trip over God, are you? No, he's spirit. And he's unchanging. So the, in the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, the laws of logic reflect the thinking of God. God's thinking is everywhere because he is everywhere. God's thinking does not change. So the laws of logic do not change. And God is himself immaterial, so his thinking is necessarily immaterial. Now, how would you go about justifying this if you're in the evolutionary worldview, if you're a naturalist? Immaterial laws are kind of hard to, to justify if you don't believe in there's anything that's immaterial, right? Now, some proposals have been that they reflect chemistry in the brain, that there's just chemical reactions in the brain, but that loses its law-like uh, force. Because what's going on in my brain it's not what's going on in your brain. We have different chemistry, and our brains change over time. In fact, I, my grandma had dementia. Her brain changed over time near the end of her life. So they, that, that, that um, loses their universal property. They've all, there's also been suggested that they are, the laws of logic are merely conventional. They are agreed upon by men, by people, like societies. But there's a problem here. Now, and a good example of a convention is which side of the road you drive on. Over here, we drive on one side. Over in Britain, we drive on the other, right? Is either one morally superior to the other, good or, wrong, good or bad? No, it's just something people have agreed on. If laws of logic are conventional, then in some societies it could be acceptable to contradict oneself. You could say it is the case that, my car, that that is my car, and it is not the case that that is my car. If such a society were to exist, what would that do to language, to communication, 
and to uh, orderly uh, society and whole. You wouldn't be able to communicate at all. It destroys all distinctions. You, you don't know whether that's your car or not. You don't know whether it's, it's dark out or light out. You can't have both, right? So no one can live like the laws of logic or chemical reactions in the brain. They can't live like they are conventions. They all, everyone, everywhere, at all times, assumes, even if they don't think about it, that the laws of logic are abstract, invariant, universal entities. But they can't justify what they're doing on their worldview. Now let's go on to the laws of morality. This is what should or ought to be. Anytime you hear someone say, there should be a law, he ought not be allowed to do that, or whatever, they're applying a moral code. So whenever I hear that, I like to ask, by what standard? What standard do you make that judgment? So let's talk about morality. Now, morality cannot be relative. Now, some people strongly believe in relative morality. It was, well, that's true for, for, that's true for you, maybe, but that's not true for me. I don't believe it. Well, if, if morality is relative, then murder could be wrong for me, for you. I mean, you can't murder, but it's okay for me. I'm going to go murder all I want. Is anyone going to accept that? No, that's a bad idea. No one can live that way. They cannot be conventional. Some people have claimed that, that morality is just a, an agreement based that cultures come together uh, to, to make. Other, but otherwise, uh, how can you condemn Nazi morality? Uh, the Nazi Germany had a, had a consensus somewhat of, a, of morality. They defined Jews and others as non-people, and, were sub, and th therefore it could be eliminated. You eliminate stray cats, you eliminate stray Jews, right? What's wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? I'd say there is. It's everyone who goes and looked look at those concentration camps who, who knew about it would recoil in horror. That was, that was uh, absolutely evil. But if you don't have an, a, an absolute code, how can you do that? Finally, morality cannot change with time. Now, sometimes circumstances change with time, but can you imagine, like, murder was, was wrong last week, but now it's okay. Now it's okay to kill someone with no good reason. And no one would, would follow that, would they? So you, what we see is that Morality must be universal, must be, say, must be ab, uh, invariant, and it must be absolute. So here's the question. How can mo that such morality, how can absolute morality be justified? And we got an answer. Barb, do you have an answer? No? Okay. The answer is you, uh, you justify this sort of morality by appealing to an absolute creator God who defines morality. That's the God of the Bible. Think about it. If the morality does not change with time, God, does God change with time? No. Uh, you, you, it's absolute. Does God absolute? I mean, he, he's all over the place. Yeah, he's not conventional or relative. You see, in the biblical worldview, good is that which corresponds to God's character. Evil is that which is opposed to God's character. And that's, and that's uh, absolute. It applies to all people all times, everywhere, every when, every circumstance. And he's going to bring every act of judgment. Is this easy to justify in the Christian worldview or hard? Say something. Easy. easy. It's easy to do. How are we going to do this in the evolutionary worldview? You believe in naturalism. You don't believe there is a God. You can't. So let's move. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's talk about the uniformity of nature. As an engineer, I really appreciate this. Uniformity of nature. It's also known as induction. Uniformity is using past experience to predict future results. An example of this, let's say you come into your kitchen and you see the, your heating element on your stove is, is glowing red. And you touch it, and it burns you and you feel pain. Then the next day you come down, you see that it's glowing again. You figure, you know what, if I touch that, I'm probably going to get burned and I'm going to feel pain and I don't want to do that. That's an example of induction. You're using past experience to predict the future. You, you, you tracking with me? Uniformity is the foundation of all scientific inquiry. Have, who here has learned about the scientific method? You observe, you go and have a hypothesis, perform an experiment, see the results, write it up. You do it again and again and again. Well, so that's just basically looking at stuff, and if you have the, perform an experiment with the same conditions, same temperature, pressure, whatever else, and you do it again, you should get the same result. This is using induction. So induction is the basis of all science and engineering. Uniformity cannot merely be assumed if it is to be known. Why? Because knowledge is justified, true belief. So you've got to justify it. Unfortunately, 
Uniformity has proven very difficult to justify and is used as the example of circular reasoning in logic textbooks. So we're going to do this. Now, here's this big, long quote. This is a great quote. I'll put it on the, all in one slide for people who want to look at it later. But I'm, what I'm going to do is go through it piece by piece so you can actually read it, because I think that's probably a little too small. What do you all think? Yeah. So this is from Kofi and Cohen's introdu Introduction to Logic, 12th edition. If you want to learn logic, it's a good book. Anyway, so it says, powerful minds sometimes are snared by this fallacy. He's talking about begging the question. His Latin name is Petitio Principi, which sometimes logical fallacies are known by their Latin nomenclature. But begging the question also is just circular reasoning. So powerful minds sometimes are snared by this fallacy. Logicians have long sought to establish the reliability of inductive procedures by establishing the truth of what is called the principle of induction. This is the principle that the laws of nature will operate tomorrow as they operate today, in that, that in basic ways nature is essentially uniform and that therefore we may rely on past experience to guide our conduct in the future. That the future will be essentially like the past is the claim at issue, but that claim turns out to be very difficult to prove. Some thinkers have claimed that they could prove it by showing that when we have in the past relied on the inductive principle, we've always found that this method has helped us to achieve our objectives. They ask, why conclude that the future will be like the past? And answer, because it has always been like the past. Are you seeing a problem here yet? Yeah, it's circular, huh? But as David Hume pointed out, this common argument is appetito. It begs the question. For the point at issue is whether nature will continue to behave regularly. That it has done so in the past cannot serve as proof that it will do so in the future, unless one assumes the very principle that is here in question, that the future will be like the past. That's interesting. So how? So, so far, no one, well, people, some people have, 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 have some good ideas, but it's very difficult to justify this, but yet all, the, everyone believes in uniformity. In fact, you ever met, met an atheist evolutionist? How, what's their what, what's their god? What do they normally say? Uh, you know, put their authority in nature or science. Science has proven, but science is based on uniformity. I kind of wonder how they can justify this. So, how can uniformity be justified? Does anyone have an answer? This is a hard one. No. Answer: You appeal to the Bible. How, question: How do we how do we justify logic? We appeal to the Bible. How do we justify morality? Appeal to the Bible. How do we justify the uniformity of nature? Appeal to the Bible. Here's how we do it. The Bible, now, the Bible claims to be the word of God who knows everything uh, and cannot lie, and he loves us, right? So when he tells us something, we might want to listen to it. Here's something that God told Noah it's right after the flood. He said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. That's Genesis 8:22. So God here has promised us that the basic cycles of nature will continue as long as the earth endures. Now, is, does, that, does that sound like uh, uniformity? Things will, that, yeah, the, the future will basically be like the past. Since the all-knowing creator God has told us this, we can justify it by him. So in a Christian worldview, we can justify science. It's, it's embarrassingly difficult to do in an evolutionary worldview. So I'm always a little bit confused when I, people tell me that science has disproven the Bible. I'm wondering, well, how do you justify science first, sir? So this brings us to the ultimate proof of creation. The Bible must be true by the impossibility of the contrary. Now, I'm going to let this sit for a second. This is a, this is a, I see my mom is looking kind of confused. We'll talk about this. I'll have a little bit of discussion here because this is the, this is the, 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 the key po moment. Since the preconditions of intelligibility are only justifiable in the biblical worldview, to deny that the, the truth of the Bible is to deny that anything is knowable. Okay? Are you tracking with me? Let's put it, a, or let's put it another way. I'll put it in syllogistic form, you know, in a syllogism. If the Bible were not true, it would be impossible for us to know anything. We do know things, right? We do know things. We have knowledge. We do know things, therefore the Bible must be true. Now, how can I make such a statement? Now, this is a bold statement, and I know, and I've had people mock me for this, but why do I, wh how can I justify this statement? Uh, I'm looking for an answer here. 
Anything? Anyone? All right. So let's talk about, so before we can know anything, what do, what do we have to have? This is review here. We, we got to justify true belief as knowledge. So we got to justify things. But before we can even begin to reason, we've got to, ha to be, ha have some things called the preconditions of intelligibility or the preconditions of intelligible thought. This is why I was talking about logic, morality, and, uh, and uniformity. If you want to, to use science, uh, observation of the world to, to gain knowledge, you've got to have uniformity. If you don't have uniformity, then you can't use past experiences to predict future behavior. And then, you, then your experiences mean absolutely nothing about the world. You're tracking with me. So if you don't have uniformity, you don't have science. If you don't have science, you've got no, no, no experience of the world that can be brought to bear on any situation. Whether it's you know, getting in traffic, whether it's the heating element in your kitchen, whether it's you know, dogs biting you or something if you, if you are mean to them. I mean, it's all based on uniformity. So if you don't have uniformity, you can't have knowledge of, you know, of the world. And you can't have uniformity unless you can justify it. Can it be, can, apart from the Bible, can uniformity be justified? Now, I know people that will claim that some other god can do it or the, or the god of evolution. They say, well, theistic evolution will save the day. But it doesn't work because the Bible doesn't teach evolution. And if you, and if you try to put evolution into the Bible, what have you done to your ultimate standard? You've, uh, you've destroyed it because now you have a different standard because something else is, is judged higher. Incidentally, we recently had a Chafer conference. But the topic was uh, the, what was it, the scripture? I forget the word. Anyway, it was the, the uh, infallibility of Scripture, the inerrancy. That's it, inerrancy of Scripture. Now, this is, and the inerrancy of Scripture is a logical necessity. You cannot escape it, and if you escape it, you're just not, and if you try to get off, out of that, you're just not a very good thinker. Because if you're, let's say, because we claim that my, our Bible is the ultimate standard. Everything starts here. All reasoning starts here, right? If this thing is inerrant, what have you done? If you say this thing has errors in it, what have you done? Here you saying something. Yes, not your standard. You've judged it by some other standard. Like the Jesus conference went, went through the, with their exacto knife and cut up the Gospels. And had different th said that Jesus said one thing or didn't say another thing. They were judging the Bible based on their reason, what sounded reasonable. So what then is their ultimate standard? Themselves. And if you want it, so you will always, by logical necessity, you will have inerrancy somewhere. It's, if it's not in the Bible, it's in you. Or if it's not in you, it's in the majority opinion of scientists. But on the face of that, how does that work? Who here is infallible? Who's here, who here is inerrant? Who here thinks a group of atheist scientists will be inerrant? No. So we, by logical necessity, it's absolutely inescapable. You're going to have some source of inerrancy. And it better be the Bible or you're going to be on, on quicksand. Now getting back to the ultimate proof here. Let's see, where was I? Oh. So... The, uh, the, bi the uniformity is only justified through the Bible because God has told us that the uniformity is going to continue. Moral absolute morality is only justified in the Bible, and we have to have that. Otherwise, there can be no right or wrong. Now, some people claim there's no right or wrong, but nobody can live that way. It, what the, what they, how they live clashes with what they believe. You tracking with me? I once had a professor at, at Texas A&M. He was... Uh, he, loudly proclaimed that he was an atheist, that there was no moral, there was no meaning in life, that everyone evolved from, from pond scum, and that, there, and that man, men, women are just no more than evolved animals, chemistry in action. But you know what? He, that, that man had a, had a son who got in a car wreck, and, and he was hurt. He didn't die, but he was hurt. You know, did, do you think that man treated, felt like that his son was more than just evolved pond scum? That he had value, that he was a maybe made in the image of God and had more valuable than, than a dog or an amoeba? He did. People can profess whatever they want, but they can't live like that. Similarly, similarly, you cannot have justified the unit laws of logic apart from God, the, the creator God. You tracking with me about that? So if you can't justify the laws of logic, if you cannot justify the laws of morality, if you cannot justify the uniformity of nature and your worldview, can you have knowledge at all? Tracking with me? Are you starting to make sense or, or is anyone still lost? 
No, okay, I think I'm seeing some understanding here. Well, that's good. I like understanding. So, the, to give, I'll give you an illustration here. Imagine somebody who is a critic of error, who's skeptical that error exists. He says, well, I can't see it. I can't feel it. I don't have any reason to believe in it. Now, what, now he's making an argument, and you hear it. What does that mean about his argument? It means it's wrong. Because how are you hearing his argument? Through air. His, your, his vocal cords are vibrating and causing air molecules to bounce into each other that, go, that move out, and eventually it reaches your ear. So you, he's hearing you through the air. In fact, he's breathing while he's talking. And the fact that he's alive says that there's air. So the only reason that he can make an argument is that he's wrong. If he was right, then his, then his argument, then he would die and he couldn't talk, right? So similarly, the critic of the Bible can only criticize the Bible because he's wrong. You're tracking with me. If you, because he says, if he wants to make a, say, you Christians are so immoral, you should stop hating gays. What's he making? What's he doing here? You hear the key word there? You hear should. That's a moral statement. Where's your moral code? How do you justify morality? Or, you idiot Christians, don't you know that science has proven the, evolution or the fact of evolution and that the world is four and a half billion years old, not the thousands of years that, the, that your goat herder people wrote in the Bible? I've heard that. I mean, but what, what are they arguing here? They're arguing from science. And can they justify science on their worldview? No, the only reason they can make it their argument is because their, their argument is wrong. Now, you can, now, atheists do science. Atheists are, have morality. Atheists uh, do think logically sometimes. But they can only do this because they're, they're borrowing our worldview. They're borrowing from the Bible because although they profess, in their, they profess their mouth to be atheists, they can't do that in their heart. Romans says that the fool said, the Bible says the fool said in his heart there is no God. The Romans says that uh, he's been made known to himself to, to all men through general revelation. There is no true atheist. Even the most ardent atheist, even Richard Dawkins, knows that there is a God because he acts like it. He, he believes in absolute morality. He talks about how he says that teaching creation to children is child abuse. Well, that's a moral statement, isn't it? How does he have an, who's the atheist to, to, to lecture about morality? He taught, he, he's real big on science. Thinks science has disproven the Bible, but science is based on the Bible. You tracking with me here? You 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 uh, you you're on the same train with me? Any, do I have any objections yet? Objections? Man, I got a docile crowd today. I like this. So, now what does the Bible say? This the Bible's got a few things that I think uh, indicate that this is how God thinks. This is the I don't want to keep the entire quote from the sense. It's a long quote that, that uh, Colossians chapter two. But Paul writes that, that, that these people are, uh, believe in Jesus, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, now, so what treasures of wisdom and knowledge are not found in Christ? There's not a single one. So if all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ, what happens if you reject Christ? You don't have any wisdom or knowledge, right? This is exactly what I'm saying. And now, here, here's a couple proverbs. That the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, anyway, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Also, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Does that sound like it goes along with uh, the Colossians passage? So, the, now, is it the end of knowledge? Is the fear of the Lord the end of knowledge? No, it's the beginning so this is our beginning of knowledge. This is our ultimate standard. And by this, we justify, our, we justify uniformity. So then with this being true, we can go out and look, at the, look around and say, you know, we observe the, the world, we observe astronomy, we observe biology, geology. And then we can, starting from the Bible, we can build our logic chains and they don't collapse. And we can have a lot of knowledge that's not found directly in the Bible but is linked to the Bible by logical chains. You, you seen how this works? You understand? So, okay. Well, next what I got, I only got, got about 10 minutes. I've got, I want to open this up for some questions. If anyone's got any question, please ask it. You, y'all been, been a great audience, been real, real supportive and quiet. So what, what, I've, what I've got here are some examples of, uh, of 
objections by various atheists. So we can talk about them and try to analyze them. But before I get there, if anyone's got any questions you want to deal with, raise your hand. We'll deal with them now. Okay, let's move on. So here's, here's one from uh, G. Ed of Edmondson, uh, NB Canada writes. This is, this, these are examples from, J from this book, from The Ultimate Proof of Creation by Dr. Jason Lyle. Fantastic book. But I've, just, I've taken these examples from here. It says, your denial of basic science will discredit and it will in the long run discredit you and your cause. The empirical evidence is available for all to consider. Your message is akin to asking us to believe that the world is flat or, or that the sun revolves around the earth, despite overwhelming empirical evidence to the contrary. Okay, so now I want you to, now given what we've just talked about, what we've learned, I want you to spot his assumptions. What are some key words here? Bart, it looks like you got something. Denial of basic science. Yes! Banal basic science. Also, how many times has you mentioned empirical? He has empirical evidence, science. So, you know, twice he mentions empirical evidence. So this guy sounds like an empiricist. So I'd be inclined to uh, ask him about how he justifies science. I mean, you, you, you see this. It's good to know a lot of science. I like it. I learn a lot. There's, it's useful, but you don't have to know all the science to spot someone who says, you know what, this is, this is wrong. If you're saying that the science proves the Bible's wrong, then I know that you're wrong because of, because of this. You tracking with me? Okay. You want, you want to move on to the next one? Sure. Here's R from San Francisco, California writes, how can you honestly deny science and be so ignorant to the obvious truth about our beginnings? I pray that you'll have an epiphany and stop misleading people to believe in nonsense and lies. You're ultimately going to turn people off to God. If anyone has half a brain, they're going to look to science for truth, not 4,000-year-old stories written by goat herders. So, now, yeah, th this is real stuff, though. This is why I included them, because this is not just something I made up. This is real stuff. So, what's the problems here? There's more than one. Got it. Obvious yeah, deny science. Yeah, deny science. They got the science. Obvious truth. They believe in, in, in truth. What is truth? Yeah, that was, that, was a, uh, that was a profound question that Pilate asked, isn't it? What is truth? Yeah, you've got you to figure out what that is. Also, there's some, uh, some logical fallacies here. Now, I'm not teaching about logical fallacies, but when he says things like, uh, if anyone has half a brain... That's a question-begging epithet. They're using emotional language to make the argument rather than giving facts. So you could, if you wanted to reply to him, you could say, well, I, 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 I appreciate that you, uh, you have a high regard for science, but do you know that the science is only justified through the Bible? Or you know, that sort of thing. Also, uh, he, he, he seems to think it's bad for people to, to, he says, stop misleading people with nonsense and lies. What does that imply? Morality! You shouldn't lie to people! Now, I wonder why in, 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 a, in, in a non biblical worldview, it, uh, lying is bad. Now, this guy seems like he might be a theistic evolutionist or something, because he says he prays. Now, now, let's talk a little bit about why, the, why adding God to evolution or, or having any of these long ages or you know, compromised positions is bad. Because if you believe, let's say, let's say you believe in, um, that the, in theistic evolution, and you've you've done. Does the Bible teach that clearly? You know, in the in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's evening, and morning, one day. Evening, and morning, two, second day. Evening, and morning, the third day. Created the the, the animals on the the sea sea creatures and the birds on the fifth day. Sixth day created the the land animals and man. Does that sound like evolution? No. If they believe in one of these compromised positions, theistic evolution, day age theory, framework hypothesis, celestial temple inauguration view. Don't even bother looking these things up. They're hard to, they're not worth reading. But they believe in any of these things. What they've done is they've taken something from outside the Bible and imposed that on the Bible. And now they don't, now, now this is not their ultimate standard. And what they've done is they've shifted that to the majority opinion of secular God-hating God scientists, right? So, so if they say, so they say, they've tried to appeal to that God, you say, well, how are you doing that? The God that wrote that also wrote that uh, Jesus died, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How are you going to believe one and not the other? You see, you see how this can be used against any non-biblical worldview. Tracking with me? 
Okay, let's move on to the next one. B from Buffalo, New York writes, Get over your childish self-pacifying beliefs and deal with the fact that the world is senseless. If perchance there is a God and a real and a reason behind this madness, they certainly will not be found in a book as flawed and disgusting as the Bible, unless you promote slavery, misogyny, and the condemnation of billions of people to eternal torment. The claim that T-Rex was a vegetarian prior to the fall is so absurd that it scarcely deserves commentary. Now, he's uh, referencing the, the, the idea that in the beginning, all the, that the plants were for food for all animals and for man. And so it's, specu it's speculated that all animals originally were vegetarian and in the future will do so. Can anybody think of a Bible verse that might talk about that? Something like that? Think in Isaiah. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The lion will eat straw, straw like the ox. Man will, know, will beat their swords in the plowshares and will never learn war again. That's in the future. We know that lions are going to be plant eaters. So anyway, he, he, he's got this idea. Now, what are some key words here? What, what, what's going on here? What's some key words that you think that, that he's assuming? What's, what's, his, his ba what's under that iceberg? But he doesn't believe that the Bible is the ultimate standard. That is true. He, uh, he, he definitely uh, doesn't like it. Why doesn't he like it, ma'am? He says it's flawed. He says it's flawed. In fact, he goes even farther. It's flawed because it's disgusting. It's, it promotes slavery, which is evil. It promotes misogyny, which is evil. And pr promotes the condemnation of billions to eternal torment, which is evil. Oh, he's, making a he's making a moral judgment. And I'm wondering, oh, what kind of standard do you have, sir? Let's talk about this. Now, there's different ways you can go about actually dealing with people, even this method. But, I'm, but you know, internally, when I, when I hear these statements, there's like an alarm that goes off, I'm like moral code, laws of logic, you know, science, or, or other assumptions that don't make sense with what they profess. You tracking with me? All right, let's see, I got another one. S from Rome, Italy writes, this has to stop. The Bible is just a rework of other stories and religions about the t time in question. It's insane to keep saying that the word of God is the word of God. Jesus was no more God than Krishna or Horus. It's not good for humanity to continue being so superstitious and ignorant of fact. You have no proof that the Bible is divine, just like there is no proof that Sai Baba is divine, yet he has followers in the millions. The Bible is a forgery just like the Talmud is a forgery. So, where's, where, what's, where, 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 where would you pick at in this one? Let's see. Well, first, he's making a logical argument. He's saying that these religions are, that these religions are forgeries, therefore this is a forgery. Whenever you see a, you know, a word that, you know, therefore, or you know, see a conclusion, that, that he's using laws of logic. Also, you notice this word, good? Ah, oops. There we go. Good. What is good and what is evil? If you say something is good, what is that implying? A moral code. And, this is, and if he's saying that you need a change based on your, your moral code, is this a relative code or is this an absolute code? Because it's saying it's coming from me and applying to you. This is an absolute code. So this guy is, is invoking absolute morality. Oh, you have a moral standard. Let's talk about this. Where do you get your morality from, sir? Because I'd love to talk to you about the, the lawgiver and the giver of life. What do you think? Let's see. You know, uh, I'll give you one last example. This is something I did when I was, uh, as some of you know, I went to a mosque for a year. I went, went in there and talked to the imam and tried to share gospel with Muslims. It was a fun time. And I used this method in defending the scripture. It was really a, a great time. I, I, I would get, go to the imam's office and either talk to the imam who was trained for eight years in Saudi Arabia, uh, or I would talk to like five or six different committed Muslims and they were just attacking me from every angle trying to discredit Christianity so that I will convert and become a Muslim. Well, eventually my, I, my answer to them was, that, was this. I followed the uh, Quran and here's some Quran verses. And they, the unbelievers, planned to deceive and Allah planned to deceive the unbelievers, and Allah is the best of the deceivers. Uh, and in another verse, it says, those before them did also devise plots. That's deception. It's the Arabic word makah, which means to deceive. 
But in all things, the master of planning or deception is Allah's. He knoweth the things, the doings of every soul, and soon he, will the unbelievers know who gets home in the end. So the unbelievers are going to get what's coming to them, and all deception is Allah's. So, and here, this is more for uh, notes, but there's a, a story that's real important in the, in, the, in the history of Islam called the Battle of Badr. Muhammad had left Mecca and went to the city called Yathura, which later was renamed Medina, which is the city of the prophet. And there he made his first Muslim community, and he went to war with the people of Mecca. Now, there was, the, the Battle of Badr involved a, a large caravan from Mecca. And this caravan was, uh, you know, it was large, it was well defended and armed. Now, Muhammad had a vision from Allah, and in it he saw this caravan was weak, few in number, and uh, bedraggled. They, didn't, they weren't strong. So Muhammad got his guys together and, and attacked it. And he, he was vastly outnumbered, vastly outclassed, but because it was such a surprise, he destroyed the Meccans and won a great victory. This is one of those you know, key points in the history of Islam. And then Allah went and told Muhammad, well, I, I showed you, I lied to you. I showed you they were weak and weary and few in number because otherwise you would have lacked courage. I needed you to go there and fight. Now, does, a, does the God of the Bible operate like that? No, how do you do with Gideon? They're big, and I'm going to lower your numbers so that you know that I'm the one who brings the victory, right? So what I told them, I think that, no. What I, what, the way I responded was that... Uh, there, is there anything God? Is there anything that God cannot do? Does anyone here know? Is there anything that God? I'm talking about Christian God here. Anything that? Wow. That's right. Titus one two. We know that God, who cannot lie, promised from long ago you know, salvation. He also cannot deny Himself. I believe that's Hebrews six eighteen, if I remember correctly. That's His character. So He cannot contradict Himself. So He's bound by His own thinking, His laws of logic. He cannot lie. Our God is the truth. He cannot lie. In fact, we know who the liar is, right? Who's the liar? Satan. Whenever they speak a lie, they speak from his, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature because the truth is not in him. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of lies, right? So my argument to them, but the, the imam could not answer. He tried to shift the topic. Was that if, the, if Christianity is true, we can believe it because our God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and he cannot lie. If Islam is true, you can't believe it. Because Allah is the greatest, he's the greatest of the deceivers. And all deception is Allah's. He lied to Muhammad. And, and there's another section where it says that every time there's revelation, Satan puts some de de deception in the revelation, which would include the Quran. If, the Islam, if Islam was true, could you trust it? Could you know it? The answer is no. And they, they never had an answer for that. Because I'm not, I got beyond the surface dealings and got to the heart of the issue of what is truth. You tracking with me? So, now this, had, I had to do a lot of study and thinking to try to come up with this, because I was, I was like, how do I deal with all this, these guys? But it looks like, ooh, it looks like I've run over by about four minutes. Do we have any last questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings, or stories? Anything at all? All right, well, I guess I'll wrap it up and let us, let us get out of here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity we've had to gather together and talk about your word. I pray you bless everyone as they go home. Help them to, with their endeavors. I know everyone's got their own trials and tribulations. Once again, I pray for all those folks that are suffering in the hurricane. And pray for my pastor, Robbie Dean. Help him have a wonderful trip in, in, uh, in Italy and come back well to us. In the name of your son, Christ Jesus, in whom we have life, whom we have hope, and whom we have knowledge and wisdom. Amen.